Yes, Jesus is saying that. That means his sonship and fathership of the father is not unique to him. It's the same as your father too. But he didn't stop there to, to remove ambiguity. He says, I go to my God and your God. No Christian preacher highlights this verse, to my knowledge, in the teaching and preaching in their sermons, that Jesus says, I go to my God and your God. Have you come across any teachings like that? Next time, go and listen to the sermons about Jesus and see whether any pastor, any, any preacher uses this verse, I am going to my God and your God. Because it will enlighten and, and in, it will awaken the hearts and the minds of critical minded people. How can Jesus say he's going to his God? He's supposed to be God and son of God. God doesn't have a God. God cannot have a God because he is the self-sufficient one. Someone has a God because they are dependent and reliant. They are contingent on that God. So when Jesus says, I'm, a, I'm going to my God, demonstrate without a shadow of doubt that he has a God he's going to and he's not God. He even said that they should know the only true God, referring to the Father and Jesus Christ who has been sent. So verses after verses, in the, even in the scripture of the Christians, Jesus is saying that I am not God. The one in heaven is a true God. Worship him. Every prophet and messenger said the same thing. Moses didn't come and say, worship me. Just imagine the Jewish people now tells us, you know, why don't you worship Moses? Why don't you worship Moses? You would say, why should I? Moses is a creation of God. We don't worship creation, we worship God. Likewise, if anyone comes and says, you know, worship Abraham, worship Adam, worship Solomon, worship Noah, worship David, you would say, are you out of your mind? The same people came to tell people not to worship anything but God. Jesus did the same thing. He said, you know, worship him, the Father, worship him alone, no one else. Thou shall you serve. O our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy will be done, thy kingdom come forever and forever. Whose will be done? The one in heaven. Not his will, because he was subservient to the will that who, who sent him. The one who sent him is greater than him. The one who sent is the messenger. God sends a messenger to tell the people. So that is what Islam is all about from the day one, to worship God and none else. So if we were born into a Christian family, you may have inherited this belief, but if you deep down think about it, you will say, there's something went wrong somewhere along this teaching of Christ. People have now somehow incorporated a different teaching that he didn't bring. He didn't say to people, worship me, I am God in any shape or form. He even identified who the true God is in John chapter 17, verse 3. This is one verse Trinitarian Christians wish it wasn't there. And they have no answer for that because it clearly says who the true God is. If you look at the Quran, the Quran says that Prophet Muhammad is not a new thing in the messenger. Many messengers were before him. And God sends prophets and messengers to the people for one reason only, so that they have no excuse in the day of judgment saying, I didn't know who God is. I didn't know what God wanted from me. So God, at specific times in history, because he's just, he sends them warners telling them why they were created and what they have to do, who they have to worship. And God tells us, we are created to worship God, to thank God, to glorify God, to have the utmost reverence to him. Because if you think about it, let me give you a very mundane scenario, very mundane. Imagine now I was walking past with you and a bus hit me, not bus, a vehicle hit me, bleeding almost to death, called the police, ambulance, you were there with me. I needed blood, you gave me blood to save my life because it matched. My kidneys all damaged, you gave one of your kidneys to save me. I'm recovering slowly. Weeks later, I wake up from my coma and I see you sitting there and the nurse tells me, do you know what happened exactly? I said, no, said, and tells the story. You're almost about to die and you are dying unless that kind lady 
gave her blood and gave her a kidney to save you. Now, what should be my natural response to you? Should I say get lost or should I say thank you so much? Should I not be grateful to you? My natural response should be one of gratitude. What you have done, I would not be even alive if you haven't done so. So I should be naturally grateful to be giving me life again in a way. You know, save me by giving you all of this, giving me all of these things. So my natural response is one of gratitude. God gave me two kidneys, the whole circulatory system and the heart to pump around the blood and everything else. Gave me life and the food to sustain my life. Should I not be grateful to him? My natural response is one of gratitude. That is what God wants us to to be grateful to him. Worship is not something like you do in, in go in a very um, dark night in the coldest of a pond and immerse, immerse yourself underneath the water 25 times and so that's worship, like some kind of ritual. No. Worshiping God is whatever God is pleased with. If we praise God, if we thank God the way he, he appreciates it, that becomes gratitude and worship. And are there other ways to um, do God's will than worship? So in other ways, for example, I believe, or I like to think that um, anything that gives me joy is something that God would want for me. So in living about my day with joy, then that's also me fulfilling God's will. Is that also how you... Yeah. So how you live your life in terms of your interactions with yourself and the reality around you, that could be other human beings, that could be other creations, it could be the environment. What you find joy should be something that is good, something that is beneficial, something that is good for everything else. You shouldn't find joy in killing people, robbing people, uprooting unnecessary crops and you know destroying the natural beauty and so on and so forth. If you find joy in these things, we need to think twice about why should it give us joy. But if you're not like that and you say by being charitable, by saying kind words to people, by helping the poor and the needy, the old lady helping her with her shopping. If you find joy in these things, Islam actually says many of these things are teaching of Islam. By being kind and charitable and merciful, being upright, being just, all of this. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he said, I have not been raised except but to raise the nobility of character. I have not been raised except to raise the nobility of character. That means, look at the Islamic position. You are noble by default. But he came to raise it even further. You might have a little bit of jealousy left here and there. He say no, there's no point being jealous. Look at the evils of jealousy and look at the benefit of jealousy. You should just stay away from being jealous because the evil outweighs the harm, the, the good that it does. Yeah. So an example I can tell you the Quran says about, they ask you about gambling. Yes, They ask you about gambling and alcohol consumption. Why? And the Quran says, say, in them are some benefit as well as harm. But the harm outweighs the benefit. Look, don't people find joy when they win a lottery? Many people become very joyous, very happy. When people socialize with having alcohol and it removes them from the stress and the anxiety and the depression, but because it somehow digs into another state of mind, people have joy. But the Quran says, even though there might be some benefit that you perceive, the harm outweighs the benefit. So stay away from it. What are the harms? To give you an example, most of the accident and emergency admissions are done the violent crimes that happens, people come to A&E in the hospitals are because of the influence of alcohol in UK, for sure. So we know the harm there, what alcohol does to people. It befogs their mind, they can't think straight. They go come at home and become angry or in the pub, in the streets, wherever, and they are fighting, violent, become so violent. They have domestic violence because of that and various other reasons. Gambling, 
Look what gambling does to people. It makes them lazy. It makes them not responsible. They want free lunch. They want easy money. They want easy wealth, easy resources. It puts you like on a couch potato. You sit there, you think, and you win the lottery, and then you will have all the money that you need. What we will do, it creates within you greed. Greed. And in fact, many of the world's problem is because of greed. A country usurps, invades another country because of the resources it has. Oil, gas, natural resources. Why do you see the West was happy with you know, going, invading another country and so on? Because they have made a deal already. We're going to take the pipeline from there to us. That's what it is. Greed. Greed makes people such that they no longer remain kind to other, compassionate to other. Imagine now, you know, in, in fact, the, the, the idea of usury and interest. Look what it does. Even though you might say, okay, fine, you know what, I can get some money and then do some business out of it. But if I was in need, I ask you for 5,000 pounds, and you say, no, give me 7,000 pounds back. You're exploiting my weakness because I don't have that money and you want extra two thousand pound on top of it as an interest because you know that I am weak and vulnerable and you're exploiting that situation. That's not kindness. That's not showing empathy or sympathy. That's not showing some kind of, you know, you know, this idea of humanity. You're exploiting, you're an abuser. You're abusing my vulnerability. So many of these things that we see, there might be some perceived benefit, no doubt, but the harm outweighs the benefit. So Islamic principle is stay away from all of that. So Islam says it came to perfect the nobility of character. So if you find joy in helping others, being kind to the others and so on and so forth, this is something that is praiseworthy. This is something that God appreciates. God created you to live in a society in which you live in mutual harmony, mutual tranquility between yourself, tolerance between yourself, even though you might disagree. That's the message of Islam. The Quran says, you know, if you, if you don't want to believe, the consequences are going to be in the hereafter. No one can force a belief on you because belief is a matter of conviction of the heart and the mind and then manifest that in the actions of the limbs. That's what faith is. So if you really believe in God, you would want to show that with your limbs actions. If you love someone, you don't simply just don't do nothing. You express it, what's in your heart. You say, I love you, maybe. You bring some flowers and presents and so on. You demonstrate with your actions. And, and, and do you, uh, believer, or, and if so, how do you explain synchronicity? Incidences, but what I like to think God incidences. Explain a bit further. So, um, some people may say, Oh, it's a coincidence that, that I bumped into this person who needed something I could give them, for example. I like to think of that as a synchronicity where it feels like it was orchestrated by God. So, do you see, do you believe that God orchestrates people meeting each other who can help or? Other yes, that yes, yes. Time. God constantly guides us. He has not left us, created us like a deist God and says, you do whatever you're going to do. No, God constantly guides us, shows us the guidance, whether we are grateful to him or ungrateful. God says in the Quran, He guides you, shows you both ways, two ways, good and the bad, whether you're grateful or ungrateful. So imagine now, a person is worshipping an idol, in front, meditating in front of an idol and meditating and meditating, and a dog comes, lifts its hind leg, and urinates on the idol. The worshipper looks at it, becomes so angry. My God has been defiled. Start chasing the dog. As he was running on the, chasing the dog, suddenly he realized, what am I doing? My God couldn't even protect itself from being defiled. That moment of reflection was a guidance from God. It was a, an obligation on that individual then to take that opportunity and say, do the introspection.
maybe what I was doing is wrong. Maybe what I was believing is wrong. So this wasn't like a coincidence. This is the synchronicity that you're talking about. God is showing them at that point by this example that this is not God that you're worshipping. Because the God that you worship is, cannot be defiled by a dog like that. God is the king of the kings. He's the God is the, the holy one, the almighty. So throughout our lives, atheists, agnostics, people who be, may not have a correct belief in God, they get this glimpse of guidance from God. They need to utilize it, take the opportunity and say, I need to think. I'm worshiping a God that has become ignorant. A Muslim said, Jesus didn't know the hour, neither did the Holy Spirit. How can it be? How can God be ignorant? That was the moment of his guidance at that time. Maybe it was planned by God for him to come and meet me, meet you and so on, and have that discussion. And he should have taken in from there and say, let me do some introspection, let me reflect on it. If he did that and he became, he was sincere, God will guide. That is the, the justice of God and the love of God, that if you sincerely seek God, He guides you. In fact, Prophet Muhammad said about God, that God said, if you come to God walking, He comes to you running. If you take one step, you will take many steps, like 10 steps. If you approach to God, he approaches you even more, you know, you know, in more of a degree. Like if you were, if you were to, him, he will towards, run to you. Yeah. yeah. Imagine you are walking towards God. He will, he will come running towards you. Do you see the metaphor? The figure of the meaning? Yeah. Because if you open your hearts to be guided, God guides you and showers your guidance in manifold guidance. Because you are someone who wants to see God and the pleasure of God and to connect with God. This is what Islamic teaching is: that you abandon and and, and you reject by knowing with your conviction all the false deities but then you connect to God and you love God with all your heart all your mind like you've heard what the Christians say it should be something not out of compulsion it should be not something out of fear it should be out of your appreciation and when you say there is good or bad I think of expansion and constriction meaning um, something anything that's good is something that relaxes me that just becomes bigger and anything that's bad is fear is restricting and that, that these are just it's just one force that can either go this way or that way have you read the quran because there's an ayah in the quran <laughs> which is when God wants to guide someone, he opens their breast to Islam, opens up their breast, expands their breast to Islam, their chest to Islam. Expand their? Their chest. Their it's chest. like yeah, to yeah. Islam, receiving guidance. And those disbelievers, as if, and if they want this, if they want misguidance, not to be guided, he constricts them as if they were climbing up the sky. What happens when you climb up the high mountains? in a high altitude. Uh, we feel constricted because of high altitude, less oxygen. We can't breathe because of this constriction. This is how we feel. God gives that description, as you know, just describing in the Quran, gives that metaphor, this similitude to understand how God guides and leaves people to misguidance. So I believe that my emotions are what tells me how far off or how close I am to God's will for me. So if I feel really good, like like heart open, etc., then it's the sign that yes, I'm going in the right direction. And if I feel bad, it's just God telling me through my emotions that this isn't the way to go. Okay. Generally speaking, yeah. there's of course some truth in that. But we need to be very careful with this approach, especially when emotions can mislead people. Like you can watch a movie and it emotionally changes to such a point you become um, discriminatory to a particular group of people or, or some things because of what the film has manipulated in that thing. You know what Hollywood does in their movies? They have a propaganda machine, a team propagandist, they want to manipulate the minds of people and vilify or make villainized people another community because that's what their war is against them. So if it's the war against the East or the Muslims, through their movies and dramas and the serials, the literature, they will make a bogeyman like this is evil. Look at this terrorist that terrorizing the world. And then you do not even realize you watch a movie and say, ah, 
if I see someone, you know, a, a woman with a hijab next time, oh, there's a terrorist on the street. That's what it's meant to do. So emotions can mislead people because it's manipulatory, depending on where it's coming from and who controls that. So we need to check our emotions with the guidance of God and see which is acceptable and which is not. Because in the Quran, God talks about warfare and says, you don't like warfare, even though people want to come and destroy your nilidji. So you might, God says, you might dislike something which is good for you and like something which is bad for you, this likeness that you have. So God is saying, he knows what's best. Just because you dislike it, it doesn't mean it's good for you. So those people who see that, oh, I am going to be a passive individual, when people come and took my country and destroy my family, my people, my community, massacre them whole site, ethnic cleansing, genocide, I'm going to stay there. And God says, fight those who fight you. Remove the oppression. And you say, nah, fighting maybe something that you dislike because you are a person who doesn't want to. But sometimes it may be a necessity. So an illustration is there. Things that our hearts often feel, it may not be the right thing, okay? Because when you are in love, for example, your judgment becomes blind. You, you know these sayings, right? You don't see the fault of another person that you are in love with. You don't see the fault at all. Other people tell you, demonstrate to you, you don't watch them, you don't listen to them, you don't... Only later when something happens, for example, then you come back to your senses. Our emotions can mislead us, that's the point. So, in general, yes, we should feel good things, righteous things, we should feel good about it. Evil things, someone committing an oppression, someone committing murder, rape, genocide, uh, all of these things, we should feel bad about it. We should try to do as much as we can. Prophet Muhammad Islam said, again in his statement, Man ra'a munkaran fal yughayyiruhu bi yadihi fa in lam yastati' fa bi lisanihi fa in lam yastati' fa bi qalbihi and this he says okay this is ذلك or بذلك or something like this adha'af al iman aw kama qala alayhi salatu wassalam if you see an evil a wrongdoing change it with your hand meaning with force if you can't do it then try to change it with your tongue and speak against it yeah, if you see someone getting raped, you just simply say, oh, it's not my business. Try to stop that happening. If you cannot do it with your tongue, say, stop doing that, raise awareness, help, please, whatever, right? Because you're not able to, that's what it means. Fa'illam yastadi'a means you're not able to. If you're not able to because you're not strong enough, you see, you know, 15, you know, bodybuilders coming and raping someone, and you're one lady, there's no chance that you can actually defend this poor victim. If you can't do that even by saying a word because they're coming with it, they're coming with their guns and their machetes or whatever, you're, you're very scared. You should have at least the hatred of that act in your heart. If you don't have that, you have no faith, as if you have no faith. The, the least amount of faith that you have, as if it's like no faith. So that means whenever we see all this kind of evil things, there's a process of changing it. We have to have at least to the very basic minimum that this is an evil act. Many a times people have been taught by the liberal society, be complacent, don't care. Oh, so what? These are two black people, a group of black people fighting each other. You're not black, you're white. Oh look, this is happening with you know this particular community. The, the Asians are fighting between themselves. Let them be, let them kill themselves and die. It is inherent racism. You should have in your heart the feeling that someone's being beaten up unjustly. An unjust thing is happening. That's wrong. Doesn't matter even if your husband is doing it, your brother is doing it, your son is doing it. Doesn't matter. If you find that your kith and kin family is doing it, you should say, no, that's wrong. This is why in the Quran, one of the teaching that is so, em, em, it should be emboldened gold as a standards of living. The Quran says, stand firm as true, truthful witnesses. Even if it goes against your own self, against your own kith and kin. When it, 
doesn't stand firm when it comes to witnessing and testifying, even if it goes against you, your own self, in the interests. Imagine now you want to testify something. Oh, did your husband kill? Stand firm as a firm witness, truthful witness, even if it goes against your own self, your kith and kin and so on. Prophet actually even explained Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even if Fatima, radiallahu anha, his daughter, if she were to steal, she should get the punishment. And that punishment, Islam says, if you're stealing, of course, when the circumstances are met, chop the hands. No kind of nepotism, despotism, no kind of favoritism, just because he's, she is the daughter of the Prophet. She is the family of the Prophet. What happens today in today's society? Kings and queens and prime ministers and ministers and, and all of this. What happens when their children do something speedingly? You know, committing some kind of crimes. They want to just bribe them out. They don't want justice to be implemented. Islam says no. It's hatred of the act, not hatred of the people who did that. No, you say it's crime, whatever, the, whoever's done it, an unjustice act is unjust. Even if it's done by you. But when you said something, you said something about the the hatred of the act in your heart. You so that, that part is, no. When you see an evil action happening, munkar, and something that is a wrongdoing happening, if you cannot stop it, feel in your heart that this action is wrong. Yeah, if you say, that's okay. This man, this woman is just getting raped, so what? That means you have become so complacent about right and wrong, about good and bad. Yeah. I must admit, I do struggle with how I can live in this world um, without going about my day in a bit of a bubble mm -hmm. to kind of protect myself and I choose not to watch the news no I choose to just go okay well I like to believe that if I keep my eyes and my focus on beautiful things that I can be grateful for then in just in my own environment that will remain that way, pure and beautiful, and that I can live by that example to hope that more and more people will be that way. And that is my passive way of errat you know, hoping that this just eradicates itself. Sure. What is the purpose of your life, the one who gave you life? What is your purpose in life? Because you don't certainly believe you gave you yourself life. Life has been given to us. For what purpose have we been given life? Have you been given life? I'll try and think my own answer because I feel like you made it to worship. And so I would say, what purpose have I been given life? I like to use the word expansion. Expand, but what does that mean? To create um, and experience the joy of what has been created by God. Is this what God told you? Or is this something that you have come to you, your, your own understanding? Well, who is in a better? I am repeating things that I've heard that I think, ah, that resonates. I like that. So that's what I choose to believe. Like, I like to believe yeah. it. When, when I hear something and it feels good inside, I think, okay, that is something I, I want to, I choose to believe. Do you know that we can make our own purposes and it might differ between individual to individual? Yes. Yeah. That means our own determination of the purpose is not going to tell us what our purpose is. The one who made us is in the best position to tell us why he created us and gave us life. So we should seek the real purpose from the one who gave us life. We might speculate what it is, and by speculation, we know for sure many people get it wrong. Some people think the purpose of life is to be happy, is to make others happy, and that's it. Some people think that yeah. it's to have a cigar and that's it. Some people think rather wrongly between our understanding. The purpose is to make myself ha happy, whatever it takes. So if she, if, if he's powerful, if he's wealthy, rich, he sees a woman, says, I want her. He can't get her because she doesn't want him. Then he forces her, kidnaps her and rapes her. He says, that makes me happy. 
So people can have that mentality, like whatever makes me happy because that's my purpose of life. We know from these examples that cannot be the basis of how we determine what the purpose of life is. The only correct answer will come from the one who created us telling us what the purpose is. This is what the Quran demonstrates to us to be critical thinking on this aspect first. Because what if the purpose is not what people think, like, you know what, the purpose is an ultimate purpose of be obe being obedient to God, being grateful to God, and that means you follow the will of God in your life, all your life, from beginning to end of your life, you are subservient, you are submitting willingly and sincerely by this love of God to God. And the only way you can do that by following the will is by knowing what the will of God is. And the will of God is expressed through prophets and messengers that he raises from human beings and gives them the guidance and revelations and scripture and tells them, this is what God wants. God wants you to do X, Y, and Z. God wants you to abstain X, Y, and Z. God wants you to, and so on and so forth. Do you believe that God has a purpose for each person as well? Every human being needs to fulfill the purpose. God doesn't simply guide everyone individually by sending them book individually, okay? God chooses the most upright, you know, from his wisdom. He appoints who the messenger and prophet is going to be, the best person to do the job, to convey the message. And through them, he gives us the message that we follow the message. The Quran being the revelation, the scripture of God, the guidance, and Prophet Muhammad being that recipient who received the revelation, who showed in his words and his actions and his approval all his life what that message of God is for us to follow. So if one wants to know the purpose of life, one wants to you know, take him as the role model, take the message of the Quran being because the final God of message of God and follow that. Once we do that, not only we will have have tranquility in your heart that we will be saved from the punishment that is awaiting for those who are stubborn and those who are arrogant, those who are someone who wants to reject God because of their, their pride, for example. You know many atheists, they're atheists because of pride. It's not because of our argument. We've been coming in this park and speaking to hundreds and hundreds of atheists over decades and decades. What we notice in common? It's not the arguments that are powerful enough to say disprove the existence of God, it's the pride to actually accept him as someone greater than them. That is what we see. So God does not punish someone in hellfire for eternity, except only those who are arrogant and stubble disbelievers and rejectors of God. He gave them life and he and they were not grateful. And he told them like, if you're not grateful, this is what the consequence is gonna be awaiting for you. So it's still just because he tells them what is there. If I didn't know what's gonna to happen to me and I find out this happens, then I'll say, oh, I didn't know anything about it. But when he tells you, when he gives you evidence to justify that statement, then you are doing this for your own loss. Imagine now, you are admitted into a school our college university and you know it's a maths exam you haven't studied it you haven't revised it and you know the questions you can't answer it and now you're saying why have i been failed why did i get zero marks or you know f grade whatever you chose not to study you knew you had to study the subject to pass the exams so life here this is one additional thing that i'm going to tell you now life here is a test we have been created so that we can test ourselves against ourselves whether we deserve to go to heaven or hell. God could have created us and put us directly into heaven or hell because he knows how we're going to choose, right? If he's all knowledgeable, God knows whether I'm going to be a believer or a disbeliever. So he could have simply just put me into hell or put me into heaven. If I am put directly into heaven, would I complain? I wouldn't complain, I'll be happy. But if I was in hellfire, being created and put in hellfire, I would say, God, what have I done? I haven't done anything. You're supposed to be just. Why did you put me in hellfire? I mean, and if God says, but I knew that you're going to do wrong. Said, but I haven't done anything. So to remove that excuse, God has given us this life, a momentary temporary life in which everything is recorded. Just like here, we have recording, recorders who record the good and the bad. And then once we die, there will be another life, resurrection. Everyone will race back to life again to account for what they believe and what they did. And everything will be laid in front. All our records 
we can't simply deny it because you'll be there. You'll be like watching a recorded clip of yours. This is what you did. This is how you stole from someone. This is how you oppressed someone. This is how you murdered someone, raped someone. This is how you lied to someone. There will be no hiding. Then, when the judgment is there, when you go into, when, when we go into hellfire because of what we have done, we would not have a complaint to make against God because this being deserving of us. He told us not to do it and we did it. He gave us time and time again chances to repent. He says, if you repent, I will forgive you. If you repent sincerely, you've done a mistake, I'm merciful. Just sincerely believe what you've done is wrong. Make the intention not to do that again. Do more good to repel or to, to wipe out the sins and mend what you've done. If you've stolen, give it back. If you say something bad to someone, say something good in return. If you continue to do that, God wipes out your sins. He forgives. And he says, In al hasanat yudhibna sayyat. Surely good deeds wipes away the evil deeds. He's given us the mechanisms. He says, look, if you have a, an intention to do good, and you can't do good, you can't do it, you had the intention, you get a reward. And if you do it, you get many time, many false reward. Once you do it. If you have an intention to do evil, and if you don't do it, you get a reward. Because you stop yourself from doing it. And if you do it, of course you get one sin. So God has given us, look at the mercy of God, He's given us the mechanism in which even our intention is taken care of. If I have bad intention to you know, be jealous about someone, and I said, no, I shouldn't be. I get a reward because I've cleansed myself, purified myself. If I were to hit someone wrongly, unjustly, and I don't do it, I get a reward. So this is the justice and mercy of God in one, 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 in one, one uh, scenario, if you want to think, of, think about it. How God is so merciful and so just. So what is needed from us is the role of the mind to understand the revelation and apply the revelation in a, as a teaching within our lives. So look at the Quran, which claims to be the final message from God. Look at the message it gives, and you would not disagree with the message. You might initially disagree because it goes against your interest. A vegetarian might say, oh, it says you can eat animals. But God made you in a way to digest animals in the first place. God made the lion to eat the zebras and so on. He made it like that. You can't complain. This is in the natural makeup. So your own desires shouldn't be arbitrator of the truth and the reality. Like the example of I mentioned to you about warfare, about alcohol and gambling and so on. We may have different desires, but God tells us what the true reality is and what we should abstain from and what we should, should follow and do. So when we look at the Quran, mind's role is to scrutinize it, to, to verify it, authenticate and verify it, and then apply in our lives as best as we can and constantly do that, we might fall and we might slip, but come back on it. What happened when someone tries to ride a bike, some, learning to swim? They slip, they drown, something like this. So you have to get on it. You strive hard. That's what Islam says about jihad, striving to make yourself better. Yeah, constant striving to make yourself better. Remember what Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said? He's raised to perfect the nobility of character. Station after station, it becomes, you become so noble. So once you become like this, the world will be a peaceful place to live in because you won't see someone as someone unequal just because he's richer than you, just because he is stronger than you. You will see that he is a human being like you all trying to worship God. Islam not only teaches that this is what you do, it tries to inculcate within us by practical means. When we pray, we stand side by side in our prayers. Whether we are rich, whether you're poor, whether you're beautiful, whether you're ugly, fat, thin, doesn't matter, side by side in our five daily prayers. The manifestation of the true unique brotherhood and sisterhood where the differences are dissolved is in Hajj, the pilgrimage, where you will see the king and the sweeper on the street, they're wearing the same two pieces of cloth, standing and circumvating the, the house of God and worshipping. Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, labbaik la sharika labbaik, inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal muk la sharika lak. Oh, we are present here, we are responding to your call. La sharika lak, no, you have no partners. You, you, yours is all the praise. 
and so on and so forth. They stand side by side. No difference. You will see maybe a cleaner leading the prayer of someone who owns the company. Only in Islam. Because Islam removes this kind of this discrimination based on someone's color, ethnicity, someone's language, someone's beauty or ugliness and so on and so forth. The Prophet ﷺ in his last sermon, he even said, I warn you about women a few times just to be careful about them. And then he says, you all remember, there is no superiority between you as an Arab over a non-Arab. An Arab is no superior to a non-Arab. And no non-Arab is superior to an Arab. A black person is not superior to a white person. And a white person is not superior to a black person. The only difference between us is the one in piety, God consciousness, the one who is more righteous. Inna akramakum indallahi atqaqum, as the Quran says. God created us in different languages and colors and tribes and nations. Not that we despise of each other but we recognize with each other. And the most honorable among you is the one who is the most pious, most righteous, most the one who's most, you know, connecting with God, with, with worship and so on and so forth. That is the teaching of Islam. So when you look into it, if you ponder and reflect truly, your heart and your mind will resonate. It will resonate. You're welcome. What's your name? Julia. Julia, it's a pleasure speaking to you. My name is Mansoor. Um, I have been doing most of the talking, but I apologize, but I just wanted to present to you something that you may not have heard. It's often difficult in the time that we live in, the information is filtered so much that you don't see that information until it's been given to you. Okay? If I told you read the Quran, you might want not read it. So I've just given you some pointers to open up the Quran, reflect on it, read on it, and then accept Islam and be saved from the hellfire. And I wanted to ask questions, and it's perfect. And my friend has told me about you. He watches a lot of your videos. Sure. So. Thank you. I'm very uh, happy to see you. Barakallah. Thank you uh, very much for all you're doing here. Very good. Thank you. Okay. May God guide us all closer and closer to the truth. Okay. Take care. Bye.